Uh, before we get started, I just want to thank you for your support. You know, when everyone else didn't show any interest, you're always there, you always responded. I'm just, I'm just so grateful. Thank you, buddy. I'm going to need you to wait here. I'm going to go down to the camera. I'm going to call you, you're going to run, and then I'm going to get some shots of you running. All right. Got a deal? Paul? Put it there. Give me Paul. Okay, so you understand. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did you not just listen to what I said? I was knocked down, heard the countdown through the haze in the face of defeat, yeah. I was ruled out with no bail out on my own, all alone, left to bleed out. But I rose up from the ground, just like I was real bound, all the odds were against me. So I picked up the page, and now. Fujifilm X-T4, in my opinion, is an experimental camera. Uh, they've made a pretty bold move with this camera. Now, those of us who've started at the beginning with the X-Series, who've come through all the different bodies, would agree. I think that the fundamental, or at least the core success and sort of base that Fujifilm has is with photographers, not videographers. And here they are producing, in, in 2020, uh, one of the best hybrids you can buy. So. I think a lot of people are asking what, what direction is Fujifilm taking? Where are they taking us? Are they forgetting about me? Hello, John speaking. Hi, John. It's speaking. Hey, hi. How are you doing? I'm well. Good, good. I think I have arrived. You arrived. Okay, I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring the camera out to you now. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay. So unfortunately, during the shoot, the X-T4 was collected. But more importantly, let's rewind that video clip. Now, if this is not a good reason to end the lockdown with all those haircuts that are happening at home, I don't know what is. Yeah, my girls thought it would be cool for me to get a mohawk slash mullet type haircut. Thanks, girls. I do apologize. Uh, obviously, I had no control as to when the X-T4 has been collected. I am not complaining at all. I've had the X-T4 for quite a while now during this sort of lockdown period. I've obviously done the best I can in the situation I'm in with the space that I have to give you as much information on the camera as possible. What I did do is I woke up super early this morning and I actually did some tracking and autofocus tests and the 15 frames per second tests in the morning before I even started with Kodi. So I do have some information to share with you guys. I've used Kodi before in the X-H1 test. I got him to run towards me on the beach um, and in those situations I was, I was able to track him beautifully and get the shots that I wanted for the test. I was a little bit optimistic to think that I could use a small property that I have with a long lens to get him to run towards me. It was just too short uh, an area for him to do that. By the time he sat up and started walking before he ran, he was already out of, out of frame and I wasn't able to get any shots. Not because the camera couldn't do it, it's just because the space is too limited. Because I really wanted to give those who do sort of, you know, bird photography and wildlife photography and sports an idea how well the X-T4 tracks. I just wasn't able to do it and I do apologize. I first tested the X-T4's 15 frames per second mechanical shutter rate. Now, I just got Cody just on the deck. I just threw a ball to him. It's one of those uh, odd shaped balls that kind of bounces everywhere. And I got him reacting to it. And then there was one scene where we threw a ball through a gate and I got him to run past me where the camera was locked off. Now, I also, as, lo as well as the 15 frames per second, I also tested the 20 frames um, per second in the electronic mode. I know it goes up to 30, but I just wanted to see the difference between 15 frames per second and 20 frames per second. So people may ask, why do we need 15 frames a second? Is that not overkill? Isn't 10 frames a second enough or eight frames a second enough? Well, that's a good question. I find in my work that even 10 frames a second really wasn't enough. And, and nine times out of 10, unless it was action that I, I just physically couldn't see happening in front of me because it was moving so fast, I would opt not to use it and I would rather watch the action of my subject, because often in this case in portraiture, I'd be getting someone to do something. As they get to that pinnacle, that highest point in the action, I fired off just using my eyes, whether the camera was locked off, or whether I was looking through the viewfinder handhold. 
most of the time I got the shot I wanted just doing that without using any motor drive or any high sp uh, sp uh, shutter speed rate. So it was very important for me that if I was going to ever use this function that the, the frame rates have to, go to get exceptionally high for the work that I'm doing. And now that we've moved into the 15 frame rate, we're getting closer to that. Like I found that when Cody was sort of w watching that ball come down and chasing it and jumping towards it and so on and so forth, there's so much of the action that I got, but there's so much of those sort of smaller moments that I missed. Now, in those situations, you'll see I didn't even manage to get, those situations happened so fast that I wasn't even able to shoot a full 15 frames because that action happened in less time than even one second, which is hard to believe because I've slowed it down for you. It's, that is quicker than one second because I'm only getting off seven frames or 10 frames or 12 frames or whatever it is. So it just shows you how much action happens in such a small amount of time. So in those situations, I w wouldn't have been able to just watch it with the naked eye. You need as high a frame rate as possible to get every micro action or small action within the, the overall action of what Cody was doing, for example. So here in this example, I'm gonna remove every second frame out of it, and you're gonna see what seven or eight frames a second would have given you. Unfortunately, 15 to 10, I can't take out every third frame because it's not gonna give you an accurate representation of equal shutter action. So by halving it, I'm showing you what eight or seven or eight frames a second would give you. And now you can see what action could possibly be lost because I'm not consciously firing off the shutter. I'm just randomly firing it off and hoping I get what I want. In the second scenario, I use the 20 frames per second electronic mode, not mechanical mode, or at least not mechanical shutter. I got Cody to run through that area, through that gate from a deck up, very short area, I'm using a wide lens, I've locked it off because I'm using electronic shutter. I'm not using the mechanical, so I can't pan with them because electronic shutter is going to give me rolling shutter as I move. Now, they've mitigated a lot of the issues around rolling shutter, but it's not perfect and it's, not, it's going to mess the image up as I track. He comes through so fast there that way less than a second, he's moved past the frame. That's why I don't even get 20 frames per second. I get way less than that. Um, but what's interesting is how much of that action I got at 20 frames per second. Now that's incredible. So now we are dealing with speeds that are not something I can actually see with the naked eye. So those of you doing sports, high paced sort of situations where you can see what's happening, but you can't see those sort of micro, I call them micro actions, but small actions within an action, expressions, hand movement, whatever it might be. We're getting closer to the stage where we can just fire off a shutter. And remember at 24 frames per second, we have video. So we're not far off having video in mechanical and then take raw stills out of it. And we can shoot it in hand and move it, which is incredible if you, if you really think about it. So these little examples I did with Cody, I just couldn't have done with the naked eye and I had to use a motor drive. But again, in the 24, fr in the, sorry, the 20 frames per second electronic, let me remove half of them. Let me show you what 10 frames a second would be with the speed in which Cody was moving through that area. So now you can see how important it is for certain photographers to have high frame rates. And it's a simple example, it's done in my garden. So I for one will not say that 15 frames per second is some sort of gimmick. It most certainly has a function to play in a lot of photographers' work. The next test that I did was autofocus tracking in low light. Um, I did it very early in the morning. It was quite windy in the morning, but what I did was I, on a second stand, I set up my iPhone, it was a bit wobbly. I do apologize for the movement. The phone was moving even on the stand. Uh, I don't have a second strong tripod, but I filmed the back of the LCD on the X-T4 showing you what the camera was tracking, which was me, because I set it off, locked it off, and I walked in and out of the frame. And then obviously the X-T4 was recording as well. So in the first test was video. And I will tell you that when you see tests done in these reviews on any camera, not just the X-T4, quite often what they do is they film the EVF or they film the LCD showing you what the camera is seeing. And you see that the eye detect is picking up. Sometimes misses comes back, face detect, eye detect, you see it all happening. Person goes out of frame, comes back in a frame, all looking great. But what's actually happening in the camera and the time it takes the lens to respond to what's been seen are not the same thing. Now, this can be dependent on lenses. This can be dependent on multiple factors, low light, whatever it might be. But simply seeing acknowledgement of the eye in focus and face in focus does not mean focus. So what I've done in this situation is that I've filmed the back screen and I've actually split it and I've shown you actually what the camera is recording. And I actually personally think that the X-T4, from a video perspective, now I've used the X-T3 to some degree. I didn't do, a, I knew I was running out of time, so I never done, I never did, excuse me, um, 
a direct comparison between the two cameras here. And you'll see in these examples, I'm using a pretty high ISO, so you know it's low light. The lens is pretty wide open, I'm shooting at 48th of a second um, shutter speed, you know, obviously in, in correlation to my 24 frames per second that I'm shooting in. And I think it does exceptionally well considering how dark it is. So yeah, I think just from the brief test that I did, and this is not scientific, none of my tests that I've done have been scientific. I believe that from an autofocus point of view, the X-T4 performs a bit better than the X-T3 when it comes to video in low light situations. And I could presume once the light gets better, I think the gap between the two cameras is going to sort of level off. I don't think in really good conditions you're going to be able to tell the difference between the X-T3 and the X-T4. That's just my initial impression. Again, not scientific, just from what I can see in my experience in using the X-T3. In the second setup, I did tracking for photography, photo taking. I set it to continuous focus and I also went into the profiles or the settings around autofocus and I, I just chose one that I felt um, would work in the scenario that I had set up with me moving towards and away at different speeds. Um, what I did in the first scenario is I had my daughter, I still had the iPhone recording what I was shooting. I got it to actually just push down um, the shutter and autofocus in one movement and not look at the screen and not look what I was doing. So I would walk within the frame and she would just keep firing randomly as if you came across the scene and quickly took a photograph without time to, uh, you know, focus, compose, take, or whatever, whichever way you do it. This way I wanted to see how quick the camera would react. Now I know through all the camera systems that I've had, doesn't matter what brand, this, the camera doesn't always perform very well here. You lucky in these scenarios to get a, sh a photograph uh, focused on properly or correctly or nice and sharp. It, it, it very seldom happens that you just fire it off and strike it, that it actually gets what you what you want. Um, and obviously I had the face detect and I had eye detect on. Looking at the results, I actually think the X-T4 did very well. Now you may look at this and go, oh, there's a lot of shots missed here. Again, randomly firing a camera, just hitting it and just going with it. If you know how other camera systems work or even previous X-Series bodies, the results are never good. So I actually think that this is an acceptable level of, of in-focus shots to get in this scenario. The second scenario is that I had to actually push down the focus button. And by doing that, the actual camera locks onto me as a subject and has more accurate tracking as I'm moving. And in that way, she then fired off the shot as the camera pulled and tracked with me. So there wasn't that random sort of nature to shooting. And you can see how much better the camera did here. Again, this is low light. Pretty, not very low light, but if you look at the actual settings on the camera, it's pretty low light. And I think the X-T4 did exceptionally well. Now, this is where I think the X-T4 and the X-T3 are pretty much the same. I've shot the X-T3 extensively. I know what it's like to shoot in these situations. I think, can't tell you on the random shooting, the first test that I did, which would be better. Um, I think that's a lot of hit and miss for most camera systems. But on the second test, I think from a photography point of view, I think they are both top performers and I don't think you're going to tell the difference between those two uh, very easily. And then just for interest sake, I also tested the autofocus in low light. In the first example, which is low light, it does very well. It manages to focus on the background and the two cameras in the foreground without any problems. And then the second example uh, is an extremely low light. I had to raise the ISO up to 12,800. Uh, again, you can see the settings above. Here it gives mixed results. It doesn't focus on the background, but manages to focus on both the cameras in the foreground. And in my opinion, is not a definite improvement on previous generations. Going back to the intro in my video where I spoke about the core success, the core fan base, the core whatever you want to call it, the reason why the X, the X series camera has done well is the photographer. So there's a pretty loud voice out there saying, what is Fujifilm doing for us as the photographer? Okay, because 
they have sent mixed messages. The X-T4 is what I consider a mixed message. And that's why I said earlier it's a pretty experimental camera. The mixed message is this. Here we have an X X-H1. The X-H1 was touted as the video camera. All right. The X-T3 comes along. Yes, very much a photographer's camera. But a couple of video features that the X-H1 didn't have. Now I understand that because of the generational difference, the sensor difference, whatever. Okay. But if you've established that the X-H1 is your video go-to camera and you've built in the sort of in-body stabilizer, is not the X-H1 the camera that you're going to be implementing some of the features you've just stuck on the X-T4? Would have that not been the camera that would have been the better choice for Fujifilm to um, add the flip-out screen on and leave the screen that was on the X-T3 um, on the X-T4? I think these are very important questions. Now, the reality is we, we can't get into the head of Fujifilm. Now, from my experience with the limited dealings I've had with them, with management, they are a pretty sensible bunch. They run an excellent company. They're actually very good people to deal with. I think that they are aware of their sort of real strong support base. And I think they've shown that to us by the firmware updates that they give us, by the communication they give us. I don't think other companies can compare at least when it comes to firmware updates. You know, we ask for something, we, we see something wrong, they make an effort, they correct it. Have they, in every iteration of the camera, given us what we wanted? No, they haven't. They've sometimes even brought things into camera lineups that we find strange, but as we start to use it going, ah, I get it. Like, let's not forget how many people complained about the three uh, sort of uh, positioned LCD that we have on the X-T3 now. There were a lot of people complaining about it. Why can't it flip around? Why can't we see it? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's not easy to be a manufacturer trying to, you know, go through the weeds, find out exactly what's going to be the best decision for them as a company. But at the same time, there's legitimate questions being asked as to what direction are you going, Fujifilm? Have you forgotten about me, the photographer? I'm the person that's been with you since the X-T1. Why have you done this on the X-T4? And I hear that loud and clear. So I've tried my best to be as level-headed as I possibly can. Do I think, me personally, that the flip out screen, the way it's implemented on the X-T4 is the best, what was the best decision for the X-T4? No. But I'm saying that without any understanding of what's to come. What are Fujifilm's plans? I'm just saying that because having used it and I know what it's like to use the X-T3 screen, as a photographer, I don't think personally it's as good. If I was a videographer, would I welcome it? I think I would. I think for the vast majority of people uh, in, video, in videography, the, the ability to do sort of standard videography where you're behind the camera and also being able to use it in a vlog sort of situation, I think covers a lot of bases. Now, within that, there are obviously issues. You know, I've heard videographers talking about the cables that go in the side and then the lack of options with the cables, having to use the USB um, port to also be your headphone jack as well as charging and all these different things and the way the camera cables come out the side, are they going to get in the way of the mirror? A lot of these things I couldn't test. And with time, we'll find out with videographers, were these things an issue? Or will they just open up that screen and twist it before it even gets near the camera the cables and then let it lie there with the cables behind? I don't know. I can't answer these questions. So it's certainly interesting position Fujifilm is in now. As a photographer, my advice to other photographers, this is not a jump ship situation for you. This is not a play, oh, now Fujifilm's let me down and you make drastic decisions. In the bigger scheme of things, can I live with a flip out screen uh, with the other things that they've added? Um, I'm not a massive Ibis, a person who needs Ibis, but there are times in the year in my shoots that I do where Ibis is a massive help to me. So is it a, a, a great feature to be added to the camera? Absolutely. For the price difference that we see, I think it's well worth it. Do I think that the battery change is massive? It was changed for video reasons. Well, I don't even think it was changed for photography reasons. But as a photographer, I love, I love the idea of the battery. And I think it should have been implemented in the X-Pro3 and the X100V. That's my opinion. It should have been brought into all the new releases. So those are welcome additions. Um, I did an image quality test, which I shared with you. A lot of the people said afterwards that they were very impressed with the X-T2 and they don't need these cameras. Well, I think they were referring to the high ISO 
issue. Once we got up to 3200, 6400, there was no, more noise apparent in both the X-T3 and the X-T4 than there was in the X-T2. But just bear in mind that there was a lot more detail in those files. Okay, a lot, lot more detail in both X-T3 and X-T4. So from my personal perspective is that I could quite easily add a noise reduction to both X-T3 and X-T4 images, get them close to the X-T2, but still retain more detail. Um, I don't think the X-T2 is sharper. Some people said it was. It wasn't. It's not sharper. I think a lot of that has to do with color contrast and the way you perceive it because of the difference in colors. That brings on the other thing, which is color. I definitely, I know some people are saying, was it a color cast? Was it a white matter? I don't know. It wasn't a scientific test. I said everything the same. I was dealing with fluctuating light. Yes, some shutter speeds were longer than others. But what I saw through the 66 images that I took, because I took three per exposure, was that there was definitely a color difference. It wasn't just a cast or it wasn't just an, an effect in image quality because of longer drag on the shutter and things like that. I saw a constant theme across all images is that the color on the X-T4 stood out way more than the X-T2 and the X-T3. Okay. Now, in the comment section, I saw, well, you could quite easily just adjust the color on X-T3 and X-T2 and run it on, on import um, just to reduce those colors. Yes, you can, but that's not really the way color works. Every scene is rendered differently and you're going to have different effects per scene. It's not just, oh, reduce purples, reduce blues and greens on the X-T2 because it's more punchier and then run it over every image. It would possibly work, but you run the risk of running it over an image that didn't need that. Meaning, I think you still got to look at each image or at least each scene that you photographed and handle it in a certain way. Now, some people may like the X-T2's colors. Um, I don't mind them. I, I mean, I got into Fujifilm. I love the colors in the beginning, but just seeing the X-T4, how I think it has a more sensible approach to color. I don't know if that makes sense. Where well, they've just toned down those one or two areas in the color, which I thought that I was spending a lot of time adjusting in post. That means that Fujifilm has made an active decision, at least I think a wise decision, to aid the photographer where quite possibly the colors were getting a little bit too punchy and out of control. Like, I love blue skies, but in most other camera brands, or I actually not say most other camera brands, I used one particular camera brand for years. I had to constantly bring back the blue. So I appreciated that, or at least raise the blues in the sky, whether it's luminance or saturation, that when I take a photograph on Fujifilm cameras, the, the blue skies are intense. They're there, they look great. But quite often, particularly if I'm firing off an off camera flash, where I'm underexposing the scene, which already intensifies colors just by underexposing, I'm having to just bring down those blues and that happens on every photograph across the board. I can't, I haven't had a lot of experience in shooting all different scenes with the X-T4, but if already there's a little bit of less blue in there, a little bit of less purple sort of tone or colors, reds are a little bit more sort of controlled. I think we're onto a winning formula, at least in my opinion, and I think will suit a lot of photographers out there. So RQ, not massively different to X-T2, Pretty much the same as X-T3, um, but color is one of those things that I can confirm, at least from the test that I've done, is different to the other two cameras. And I think it's an important change. So bear that in mind. There are other features that I never covered on this camera. And now I just, I don't know, it's just the way I do it, the way I do reviews is that I've actually got to use the thing before I tell you about it. There's so many reviews out there, the camera gets received, you read the specs, you go watch another review, you regurgitate what that person says. I don't want to just give you information because that's the information that I've been given from another review. You know, I actually, all the things that I've, you know, spoken about in the last four whatever videos that I've done on the X-T4, I've given it a lot of thought and I've actually tested it and I've used it, even though I'm in a sort of not the best environment to do it during lockdown. I've only spoken about things that I've actually given thought and given time to think about. Like for example, the still video switch, I think is a brilliant implementation that you'd be able to go between stills and video for your hybrid shooters, that you'd be able to flick between them knowing that your settings will remain in those particular ways of shooting. I think that's excellent. I never got to use it, so I can't really expound on that, but I think you can read between the lines. I think something like that is a welcome addition and can be enough of a feature for someone to decide in video to go for the X-T4. Question. Does the X-T4's hybrid nature affect the photographer? Does it negatively impact on the photographer? In short, no. 
I don't believe it does if you evaluate the whole camera for what it offers you, for the price that it is, for the quality that it produces, for all the, the great things that we know of Fujifilm, their lens lineup and so on. I don't think it does bar one aspect, the flip out screen. In this situation, if the flip out screen bothers you enough, really bothers you enough because you've got to be bothered quite a lot by it to ignore the other benefits that the camera offers you, whether it be battery, IBIS, whatever it is. I think overall you're scoring with the X-T4 and I think it is a step up from the X-T3. Although in a lot of people's opinion, it's not a massive step up. Having used it, a lot of effort has gone into this camera. All right. If that flip out screen is a, enough of a deterrent for you, you have the X-T3 and I still believe that the X-T3 is a valid camera. Now, another important aspect to mention, um, especially for those of you who shoot a lot, and this might be a more important feature than um, a flip out screen, because you've also got to weigh up how many times you would actually want to shoot up and down in relation to all your photography. You've got to factor that in. And that feature is its shutter mechanism and how much durability that shutter mechanism gives you. Now, I've hammered my X-Series bodies, okay? They're well beyond their recommended acquisition rating. Well beyond that, okay? But I know that if I go out and shoot with my X-T2 now, it's on the verge of breaking on me. And I cannot have that going out and shooting. It doesn't sit well with me. But I've hammered them. I mean, you're looking at half a million acquisitions per camera body, even more. Like, I'm sure some of my camera bodies have got to a million acquisitions very easily, very quickly. I do all that in a two-year period three-year period I shoot a lot so I think that this is a very important feature and it's not really spoken about a lot is that the camera is more durable I mentioned it in the first video that I did I think as a professional you're going to have way more security you're going to feel a lot more confident and secure carrying the X-T4 than previous editions of the X series cameras besides the X-Pro the X-T4 is I believe still one of its most important aspects or features is its durability in particular its shutter mechanism giving you way more acquisitions a longer life a hardier camera a sturdier camera these are important this is a very important aspect of this camera so i would urge you as a photographer to if you're trying to make a decision bring that into equation if you're also looking at things like flip out screen and things like that lastly what are my hopes for fujifilm going forward i'm not just speaking as an ex-photographer here i'm speaking as a consumer because you remember i buy all my X gear, my X, my X series gear. This is a tough one because I understand that Fujifilm, I've said this before, needs to make needs to make money. They're in the business of shutting cameras to make a profit. And if they feel they've got to go a certain way because it's more profitable, I totally understand that. And they sit and play that balance of keeping their current customers happy, keeping the photography community happy, but at the same time, tapping into a market where they can Im improve their profits and we know what profits do. They improve their R&D. R&D goes up. What do we get as photographers? Better systems. But what does this require of Fujifilm? This may require Fujifilm creating new lines and specializing. They can't obviously um, sort of create too many lines of cameras because then they're just diluting their own sort of product range. But they may need to get a little bit more precise on which direction they're taking us. I love the X-Pro3. It's my favorite Fujifilm camera. I've told you this in the reviews that I did. I prefer it to the X-T range, but I don't use it professionally because the X-T offers me more from a professional point of view, most notably the larger viewfinder. So here we have a fan base that loves the hybrid viewfinder, but what the hybrid viewfinder does is that it, it, it sort of negates the ability for the camera to have a larger EVF. Okay, some people are prepared to accept that trade-off. I don't mind necessarily the smaller EVF in this, but if I compare it to the shooting experience I get on the XT range or the larger, it'd be hard to compare. So the question is, could they or would they, and this is my hope, make a variation to the X-Pro range? We already have the XC, I think it's the XC3 that came out. I haven't seen a new one on the horizon yet, but that really wasn't the same build quality and a lot of the features weren't added to that camera that you would find on the X-Pro range. But could not Fujifilm take a idea like that, even the same build and everything, titanium, whatever it is, remove the hybrid viewfinder, even if it's closed off, and implement a large viewfinder, the same as what we see on the X-T range, 
and allow this to be the photographer's camera. The question is, how many people would be prepared, prepared to leave the XT range and move across to this being a rangefinder style, knowing that it has pretty much everything that the XT um, camera offers, particularly its large EVF? I would be. I would be shooting professionally with this camera now if they could somehow implement a large electronic viewfinder into this body. So this is how I see the situation at the moment. Those of you looking to get into Fujifilm for the first time, and I know there are a lot of you, I mean the X-T4 is already sold out before the containers arrived in South Africa and I think it's sold out three times over. So irrespective of what I think and anyone else thinks, the camera is already a success, which is great for Fujifilm and it's great for us as I said before, if Fujifilm does well with this. But Really, these are the cameras that are now on the table for consideration. Do you upgrade from your X-T3 to an X-T4, which has gone back to Fujifilm? Do you keep your X-T3 and not bother? Are you getting it into the Fujifilm system for the first time? Should you buy an X-T3 or buy an X-T4? Hard to know. Should I consider the X-Pro range if I'm just a photographer? And will the hybrid slash EVF system work for me? Or do I prefer the larger viewfinder found on the XT range? And the reality is I can't answer these questions for you. I've tried to think about it myself. I just can't answer it. In the end, all I can say is that Fujifilm uh, has made an amazing camera. It's going to be a great success. It's going to tap into new markets that it ha they haven't tapped into before. They're going to increase their profits. Their profits, I hope, are going to give us better products in the long term. I think they still overall, with the balance of things, onto a willing formula. I think they still make the most unique, interesting, most enjoyable camera on the market today. There's no other camera that compares to Fujifilm when it comes to those particularly unique features and experience. A lot of this is based on perception and experience. They're, they're up there. They are creating a brilliant product. They can be proud in what they've created and... Yeah, and as for the other cameras, I can't answer those questions as to what you want to buy. Totally up to you. And I just hope that the information I've given you can help you in some way in making decisions. I thank you for this time that you've spent with me over this sort of lockdown period that I've been in and I've had the camera. I hope you've enjoyed the videos that I've put together for you. And going forward, um, I have already started the film scanning video that I'm putting together. I've been in contact with a couple of companies and I'm waiting on Fujifilm to send me one of their macro lenses which I'll be using in the process of scanning film as well as a film scanner that's coming up. And I'm hoping now with the president of South Africa's announcement that we'll be moving down to a new lockdown phase, um, phase three, and I'll be able to get out and shoot and then take you with me on more videos. So again, thank you guys so much for your support. My channel is growing. I'm so great, grateful. I'm so blessed. I love the crowd that are following me. You seem like a great bunch of people. And um, yeah, I'm just so grateful. God bless.